There's so much going on around us. But in the midst of all that is happening, we will be still. For when we are still, we'll know that you are God. Yes. We thank you thank for your you. presence with us, Holy Spirit. We are so, so grateful. Father, even as your word comes forth, demolish every activity of the enemy against your children in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Help us to press on to the mark of our calling. We give you all the praise and the honor and the glory and the adoration. We thank you. We thank you. Can we put our hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Amen. If you are glad to be in the house of God, give him a wonderful clap of friends this world. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, the word of God is quick and powerful. It will set me free and give me victory. So I'll open my heart and I'll receive the word. If you believe it, give the Lord another wonderful clap of his word. Amen. And so, Father, I testify that Jesus heals and Jesus saves. I thank you for the privilege to preach your word again. Lord, please stretch forth your hand to heal and to save. Comfort the afflicted and encourage the weak. Holy Spirit, please rest upon me as I lift up my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Can we thank the Lord one more time for his grace with us? Amen. It's Thanksgiving weekend. If you are grateful for life, put your hands together for the King. Amen. He's ready. You may be seated, please. Thank you, Lord. Now, as we uh, close out the year, I want to, uh, as I said last week, highlight some of the messages that we've received over the past uh, 10 months uh, to close out the year. Our theme for this year is be fruitful and multiply. And so even though the year is about to, to end, I do not want us to just drop the theme and move on to, to, to next year. I, I, I want us to, I want the, the spirit of this theme, be fruitful and multiply, to be embedded uh, deep uh, in, in, our, in our spirits. Uh, because it is one of the primary blessings that uh, God bestowed and pronounced on humanity as creation. Fruitfulness and multiplication is foundational to our lives. God said from the very beginning, I want you to be fruitful, I want you to multiply. And so that's something that should remain with us day after day, week after week, uh, month after month. Now, to be fruitful means to produce abundantly. That's what it means. To be fruitful means to produce abundantly. Jesus said, I came that you will have life and have it in abundance. And so a fruitful person it's a flourishing uh, person. We must flourish year after year after year. That is our divinely uh, apportioned um, you know, uh, path in life. Now, I believe that all our audacious prayers, all the prayers that we've been praying uh, to the Lord can be summarized with one sentence. Lord, make us fruitful. Lord, make us fruitful. Make us fruitful in our spiritual work. Make us fruitful in our ministries. Lord, make us fruitful on our jobs. Make us fruitful uh, in our businesses. Make us fruitful in our finances. Make us fruitful uh, in, in our homes. Make us fruitful in our families. Make us fruitful by blessing us with spouses. Make us fruitful in our health. Lord, make us fruitful by blessing our children. Lord, Make us fruitful. Now, it is God's desire to bless us. It's God's desire to, to make us fruitful. So let's expect to be fruitful continually. Amen? Year after year after year, let's continue to expect to be fruitful. Again, when God created uh, Adam and Eve, he said in Genesis 1 and 28, he said, the Bible says, then God blessed them. God blessed them. And then God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. This is at the very beginning of creation, a, fundament, a fundamental blessing that God bestowed upon uh, humanity. And then in Genesis 17 and verse 6, the Bible says, God said to Abraham, I will make you very fruitful. Not just fruitful, but very fruitful. I will make nations 
come out of you and kings will come out of you. And so that's generational fruitfulness. Abraham, even after you are dead and gone, there will be fruit coming out of you. Kings will be coming out, out of you. Nations will be coming out of you. So, so I'm going to bless you and bless the generations that are yet to come out of you. May God make you generational fruitful. Amen? In Psalm 1 and 3, the Bible says, The righteous person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. And so, that righteous person will always yield fruit in season. And whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does, prospers. And so, may you be fruitful in season, and may everything that you do prosper to the glory of the living God. Amen? In John 15 and 8, Jesus said, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It is to my Father's glory that as my disciples, you bear much fruit. And so, fruitfulness brings glory to God. Now, I believe that we've sown a lot uh, in various ways this year, and I'm believing that as the year comes to a close, the fruit will come in, and as we enter into the coming year, the fruit will continue to come in, amen? Because fruitfulness brings glory uh, to God. I want to remind us about uh, the three keys to fruitfulness which we talked about at the very beginning of the year. And as I said, I want us to remember some of the sermons that we've heard all through the year as we close out, so that we can close out the year filled with a remembrance of the things that we expect uh, God to do. Three keys that can make our lives fruitful. Keys are important. Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 19, Jesus said, and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be lost in heaven. And so a key is an instrument of access. A key opens the door so you can enter and possess. Without the spiritual keys that Jesus is talking about, we cannot access the blessings of heaven. And so Jesus said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now the keys to the kingdom of heaven are spiritual principles that give you access to the treasures of heaven. And so when Jesus talks about giving us the keys uh, to the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about the fact that there are certain spiritual principles that he wants to give us so that we can access the blessings of heaven. And so three keys to fruitfulness, which is our title, refers to three principles that will open the door to a fruitful life. Now, many times, uh, the Bible describes life in agricultural terms. And that's why the righteous man is described in the Bible as a tree by streams of water. So your life, hear me carefully, your life is like a farm. That is planted with seeds. For the farm to be fruitful, three things must happen. Number one, the soil must be good. Number two, the seeds must be sown generously. And number three, the branches of the trees themselves must be pruned. Now, if the soil is good, if the seeds are sown generously, not, not scantily, but generously, and if the, the trees are pruned or, or taken care of, there's bound to be fruitfulness. And so, spiritually, there's also a parallel. If our spiritual soul is good, and if we sow bountifully to the spirit and not to the flesh, and if we allow God to prune us in our lives, then our lives will be fruitful. And so, let's look at the first key. Three keys to fruitfulness. The first key is good soil. So seeds need good soil to germinate. Listen to a parable that Jesus told to illustrate us in Matthew 13. Let's look at Matthew 13. Let's look at verse 3. We'll read a few verses from there. The Bible says, Then Jesus told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and 
the birds came and they just ate it up. And then some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the sun came up, their plants were scorched and they withered because they had no roots. Other seeds fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. So other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a, a, a hundredfold and sixtyfold and thirty times what was sown. And then Jesus says something very interesting here. Uh, he says, whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear. So, so in other words, I'm giving you these principles uh, and those of you who really want to pay attention to these principles so that your life will be benefited then here. Then verse 18 says, listen to what the parable of the sower means. So Jesus goes on to explain the parable. It says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who receives the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is a man who hears the word, but the worries of his life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is a man who hears the word, and then understands the word. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. And so the seed fell on four different kinds of soil. First of all, there was a soil by the wayside. Then secondly, uh, there was uh, the rocky soil. And then thirdly, uh, we have the, thorn, the, the, uh, the, the soil with thorns. And then finally, there was a good soil. Now, the soil represents the condition of our hearts as we listen to the word of God. First is the wayside soul. That's the soul that uh, fell along the path. This soul that has been worked on constantly and therefore has become very hard. So by the wayside. This represents a hardened heart. A heart that has be, become indifferent to spiritual things. Indifferent to the spirit of God. To the voice of the Holy Spirit. Those were no longer penetrates. You, you come to church, you hear the word of God, but, but it makes no difference. It doesn't penetrate your heart at all. There, there's no repentance from sin. There's no remorse when you do anything wrong. The Holy Spirit will bring conviction, but, but there's no remorse. That heart is never broken. It is impossible for such a heart to be fruitful. We're talking about three keys to fruitfulness. And the first key is good soil. And so, a heart that is, that, that is, uh, you know, uh, fallen by the wayside, that is hardened, it's impossible for that heart to be fruitful because the word of God is resisted. As the word of God is being preached, there's resistance coming forth. And so you hear the word of God, but, but you reject the word. May that not be your portion. Amen? And then there's the rocky soil. And this refers to a person who gives a superficial hearing to the word of God. This person doesn't resist the word. On the contrary, there's a lot of lip service that is given to the word of God. There's big talk, but there's no action. And so that soil is not deep at all. It is rocky. The word of God doesn't take root in that, in that heart. You hear the word. But it doesn't take root. When the cost of serving God becomes high, that person simply walks away. This is so demanding. There's so much God is asking me to do. Uh, this is too inconvenient. Why are we being asked to do all this? And so when that person's faith is tested, he finds an excuse or she finds an excuse to leave. That is a rocky heart. I remember my last words to uh, to my pastor uh, on, on our wedding day, uh, which was 37 years ago, believe it or not, this November. 
And, and I said to my pastor, uh, pastor, after he had blessed us and all that, after the reception, I said, pastor, we, we're going to do the work of God with all our hearts. And I was about to take my, my honey to the moon. But we didn't get far to the moon. We only got as far as we built. And the hotel is still there. You know, but, but I said to him, Pastor, we're going to, we're going to serve God. We're going to do the work of God with, with all our hearts. But Pastor Angel and I still look back and uh, we, we, we laugh over this. But thank God it, didn't, it wasn't just, just talk. God has given us the grace to serve him faithfully. In spite of the challenges. Amen? So may you be faithful to God no matter what you face. In fact, there's a thorny soil. That seed fell among thorns. And this uh, represents a person who hears the word, but that person is too preoccupied to allow the word of God to grow. And so the thorns in the parable represent things that prevent the word of God from flourishing in our lives. Every word that God sends forth is meant to accomplish something in our lives. And so every time you listen to the word of God, it's not just talk coming. It is God wanting to do something in your life. So it's imperative that you open your heart. Never come to church and live the same as you came. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. And so the thorns in the parable represent things that prevent the word of God from flourishing in our lives. We are preoccupied uh, with our jobs, we are preoccupied with our businesses, we are preoccupied with our careers, we are preoccupied with issues of money, we are preoccupied with family, and we are preoccupied with social activities. Those are important things. But those things should not become idols in our lives. Amen? They shouldn't dominate our lives to the point of diminishing our time for God. We can't do anything for God. We can't commit to God because we are too busy. And so God is, is the last on, on our schedule. We, we, we don't show up when we are needed to do things in the house of God. We are too tired. It is too inconvenient. It is, it is too hot. It is too cold. Uh, it is too late to drive out of it. It's going to cost too much money. I have other things to do. I, I can't con contribute to this. And so we forget that it is God who gives us the strength every single day. Now I want to be as real as I can because I don't want us to miss out on our blessings. Now the Bible says that we should remember the Lord our God because it is he who gives us the ability, the ability to obtain wealth. He gives us the ability without... God giving us the ability, we can't do anything. And so, in your business, don't forget God. Amen? Then there's a false soul, which is a good soul. This is a kind of heart that makes time for God. And so, you give priority to God. Yes, you are busy, you have all kinds of things going on, but you make sure that you cover time for God and the things of God. You, you allow the word of God to, to guide your heart. And such a person is bound to yield a fruitful harvest. Sixtyfold, a hundredfold, and thirtyfold. So the first key to fruitfulness is good soil. The Bible says, the word of God does not go out to return a void or empty to him. It must accomplish that for which God sends it. So as the word of God is coming forth, May you receive it and be fruitful in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to throw a challenge this morning. I want to challenge you to examine the condition of your heart. Every time you hear the word of God, examine the condition of your heart, especially as we are bringing uh, things to a close and we're going to be revisiting some of these messages. I want to encourage you, examine the condition of your heart. Ask yourself. Are there rocks or, 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 or thorns or, or, or some form of hardness that I must allow God to remove from my heart? Be honest with yourself. Is there anything that is choking the word of God that is coming forth uh, uh, to you? Ask yourself, is my heart good soil? If you are honest with yourself and you allow God to recondition your heart, your life 
will be very fruitful. Because the Bible says that if a man cleanses himself, a woman cleanses himself, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, fit for the master's use, and prepared to do every good way. God's will is that your life will be fruitful. He will use you in many, many ways. And so the first key to fruitfulness is a heart that is receptive to the word of God. Let's go to key number two. Key number two is to sow generously. That, that's a very important uh, spiritual principle. Scanty sowing results in a scanty harvest. General sowing results in a generous harvest. And so the Bible tells us in Luke 6 and 38, the Bible says, Give, and it will be given back to you, a good measure, press down, checking together, and running over will be poured into your lap. And listen carefully, for with the measure you use, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So sometimes we go on for years and years and years and we're wondering, why am I not seeing fruit here? Why am I not seeing fruit in this, in this area of my life? It's because of the fact that you've ignored the very basic spiritual principle. That with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Listen to Galatians 6 and 7. Sometimes I wonder, I, I say to myself, Lord, I don't want to go to heaven and then see what I missed out on earth because I didn't do what you expected me to do. Galatians 6 and 7 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Now, this is a special principle that you and I can simply never get around. And so, if you sow bountifully, bountifully, you will reap bountifully. Whatever you sow, whether it's love or, or kindness or, or respect or, or money or time, it's bound to come back to you in the same measure. Chances are that if you, you show a lot of love or a lot of kindness to someone, that person is going to show the same level of kindness to you. So, whatever you sow will come back to you. If you understand this principle, your life will be very fruitful. If you sow generously into the kingdom of God, God will return generous blessings to you. God will cause your life to be fruitful. Let, let me give you an illustration. Cain and Abel uh, were, were both children of Adam and Eve. And uh, they, they attended the same church. They heard the same sermons. In fact, God himself was their pastor. And they would have church when the Bible says God would come down in the cool of the day and then God would fellowship with them. And so they had church. They, they had sermons uh, from, from God himself. Now listen to what the Bible says about their attitude toward giving. The Bible says in Genesis 4, look at verse 2 with me. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil. He went to, to, to his farm and just picked some fruits. And so he brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But, verse 4, but Abel brought fast portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Now when you think about the firstborn, you're thinking of, you know, health. That, that, that firstborn produce is always healthy. And so he looked at the healthiest and he brought choice portions, fast portions to the Lord. The Bible says, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And so Cain was angry and his face became downcast. Some of us get upset because we're not seeing the kind of blessings that we're asking God for. And God is saying, no. You, you, you're not doing what you are required to do, and, and that's why you are missing out on these blessings. Sometimes we get upset. But, but it's not the fault of God. It's because we are ignoring a very basic spiritual principle. You see, when you are generous to God, God will show you favor. Amen? Amen? Divine favor is important for fruitfulness. Let me say that again. Divine favor is very, very important for fruitfulness. Please hear me carefully. The extent of your fruitfulness can only be determined by you. 
God doesn't make that determination for you. You determine your harvest. You hold the keys to your fruitfulness and your harvest in your own hands. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, chapter 9. I want to underscore this point. It's a very important principle. At 2 Corinthians 9, look at verse 6 with me. Remember this. In other words, don't forget what I'm about to say. Every word of scripture was written by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and I this morning through the scriptures. And he's saying, I want you to remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. This is the law of harvest. Each man should give what is decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able. God is able. God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace. That word grace simply means favor. Favor that we don't deserve. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That, that's, that's, that's plenty. That's, that's bounty. That's abundance. Abound toward you so that in all things, not just in some things, but in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good way. And then the sense is, now he who supplies seed uh, to the sower and bread for food will also increase your source seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be made rich in every way, not just some ways, but in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will abound in thanksgiving to God. Child of God, the, the size of your harvest and your fruitfulness can only be determined by you. The reason why I take time to teach the word of God is because I don't want you to hear Pastor Eric's voice. I want you to hear the voice of God as it's coming directly to you through the Bible. And so the size of the harvest can only be determined by you. You hold the key to your fruitfulness and to your multiplication. Genesis 1.28 says that God bless them. And God said be fruitful and then multiply. And so you are already blessed. God has already blessed you. But divine favor is what will determine how fruitful that blessing is going to be. You are already blessed. Because when God created us, he said, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. But it is divine favor that will cause that blessing to be fruitful. You see, King's life, when you read the story, King's life became unfruitful because God did not look with favor upon King because of his behavior. And so even though the blessing had been released, that blessing wasn't being activated because favor was not there. On the other hand, the Bible says God looked with favor upon, upon Abel. Divine favor comes when you, you, you are willing to, to make your time and, and your talents and your treasures available to go uh, to, to use. And as you give generously of your time and your talents and your treasures, God simply replenishes those things so that you can give some more. He, he will increase your source seed and then he will enlarge your harvest and he will make you rich in every way, the Bible says, and you become an instrument of blessing for others. And uh, when, when you know that from the depths of your heart, you know generally that you are being obedient to God, you are following the principles, when there's a need, you simply go to God and say, Lord, here I am. The Bible says, come and let us reason together. So you go to God and say, Lord, this is it. And so I want you to watch over your word to perform it in my heart. In my life. Otherwise, you can pray and pray and pray. And because those principles are not working in your life, you're not being obedient, the blessings are not being released. And sometimes you get upset. Let me explain something that I hope will cause you to uh, look at sowing into God's kingdom very differently from this point on. Maybe you, you've ignored these principles all these years. But, but today, God is saying, I want you to understand this principle so your life can be turned around. Listen to this. God has designated a certain portion of what he gives us to be sown back into his kingdom. We see that principle 
It might, might have three ten. Every February, we take time to go through, through the principles. And so, God gives every person a hundred seeds. And he says, I want you to eat 90 of those things, those seeds, and then I want you to sow 10 of those seeds back into my kingdom. That's 10%. That 10% represents your potential harvest for the future. And so when you keep consuming that 10% that God wants you to sow, you are simply eating the seed that you should be sowing, and therefore you are reducing the size of your future harvest. The seed you sow today is your harvest for tomorrow. Your seed is what will take care of you tomorrow. Amen? Amen? And so hear me carefully, there, there is a loss between the time we sow and the time we harvest. But the guarantee from God is that if we sow into his kingdom, which is fertile soil, the harvest is bound to follow. So every time uh, you give to God, and it'll, you, 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 you do the things that God wants you to do as you meet the needs of, of God's children and the needs in his kingdom, you are planting into fertile soil, and your harvest is guaranteed by God himself. Listen to what God said to Noah in connection with this. In Genesis 9, 22, after, after Noah had given a generous offering to God, the Bible says God blessed him. And then God said something interesting. He said, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. So as long as you and I are in existence and the earth is in existence, the Bible says seed time and harvest will never cease. In other words, every time we sow, there's going to be a harvest that is coming for. And so sowing, let me say this, is never easy, uh, you know, because the flesh always wants to hold back from, from and it's been happening since uh, the, the, the days of Adam and Eve when the, the enemy went to them and said, has God really said us? There's always that doubt that then we sow into, into, into our minds. So it's never easy because our flesh wants to hold back. The flesh wants to eat all our time. The flesh wants to eat all our talent. The flesh wants to eat all our treasures. Naturally, we want to spend all our time on ourselves and the things we want to do and you know, um, uh, use our talents uh, for ourselves and things that bring us pleasure and you know, our money on the things that we want. And so the flesh wants immediate gratification. You know, I think about this as somebody who uh, is in school and you know, they have a part-time job and they're making a little bit of money and then they say, why don't I just drop out of school and then, and then just concentrate on making money. What they forget is that the investment of time in school right now is going to yield a lot of harvest in the future. Are you with me? It's the same thing. So that person wants to eat the time right now and focus on money, forgetting that the investment is going to come forth by way of an incredible payment in the future. And so sacrificing to sow generously uh, is, is the only way to yield a bountiful harvest. If you consume all your seeds, there will be nothing for you to sow to expect a harvest uh, in future. Psalm 126 says something very interesting. The Bible says, those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go out to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. So in other words, when you have to make that you know, sacrifice to set aside the seas and, and then sow the seas, it's not a pleasant thing. It's almost a painful, cheerful thing. But then, in the future, that, those same seas will be bringing forth a harvest and then you'll be joyfully harvesting as you go along. So as you serve yourself generously uh, into times of prayer, it's a sacrifice. We, we get about 5.30 in the mornings and, you know, we get on the prayer line or, or Mondays at 7 p.m. and all those things that we announce it all the time. It's a sacrifice. As you sow your time into Bible studies so that you can enrich your spirit for God to be able to use you instead of spending all that time on social media or, or you sow your time into ministry responsibilities where, when there's an opportunity to serve, you make yourself available to serve into missions activities, and you're so financially into God's work, 
God says he will increase the store of your seed and he's going to enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Righteousness. That's a very important spiritual principle. So to reap a bountiful harvest, uh, first of all, the soil must be good. And secondly, you must sow generously. I want us to close uh, with key number three. That's pruning. If the branch of a vine is to bear fruit, the branch must be pruned. And, and, and listen to what Jesus says about this in John 15. He says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He casts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Remain in me or abide in me, and now remain in you. No branch can bear fruit of itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And so Jesus is explaining the conditions under which our lives can be fruitful. And he does this by comparing us to the branches of a vine or a tree. And so for our lives to be fruitful, two things must happen. Number one, we must abide in Jesus or remain in him. And number two, we must allow God uh, to prune our lives. Now, the branches of a vine are not independent of the vine or the branches of a tree are not independent uh, of the tree. They, they, they don't have any source of life uh, within themselves. And so they draw the strength or they, they, they draw uh, from the stem of the vine to, to which they belong. They must be attached to the vine in order to receive nutrients and to be fruitful. And if you detach that, that branch from, from the tree, it is bound uh, to die. In the same way, our fruitfulness as believers depends on our abiding in Jesus so that we can constantly receive life uh, from Christ. If Christ permeates our lives, fruitfulness is bound to occur. Amen? And we abide in Christ by doing two things. Number one, we live in obedience to the word of God. That's number one. When we talk about abiding in Christ, first of all, it means we live in obedience to the word of God. Then secondly, it also means we commune with Christ uh, in prayer. And as the life-giving presence of Christ flows through us, our lives will always be fruitful. We must allow God also to prune us. We abide in him. We allow him to, 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 to flow through us uh, uh, and to get our nutrients through him. And then we also allow him uh, to prune our lives. Now, when we talk about pruning, it means that uh, we are cutting off undesired uh, twigs that take up nutrients. Those things that, you know, uh, will take up nutrients uh, from the tree, the farmer would cut those things away. And so pruning involves two things. First of all, it means that the gardener will cut away all the dead leaves and all the dead wood and all the branches that, that, that are dead, uh, he will take time to take them away because those things will take unnecessary uh, you know, nutrients away. Uh, this is necessary because dead wood can also have a uh, disease and, and then cause the plant to decay or even uh, to die. And then second, uh, secondly, uh, pruning also means that the gardener purifies the plant. Uh, and the gardener does this by pruning off some of the live wood uh, that the potential, uh, so that the potential for fruit bearing can be enhanced. So two things. Number one, all the dead leaves and the twigs will be, will be cut off. And then secondly, uh, sometimes even live, live branches and those things will also be cut off so that the nutrients can be focused uh, to bear fruit uh, in, in, in the plant. So uh, God also does this. He, he, um, he prunes his church by removing dead wood uh, from our lives. Dead wood cannot be revived. It, it has to be, uh, to be removed. And so sometimes God will remove dead leaves uh, and, and branches from us. And God prunes us by removing things that hinder our bearing of fruit. And God prunes us by uh, sometimes convicting us of sinful things or sinful desires or, or relationships and wrong motives and lustful and immoral desires. God will prune our lives by taking those things away from us, bringing conviction so we can have those things cleansed out of our lives. He will prune us by 
you know, convicting us of, of gossip and, and slander, uh, disrespect for authority and pride and, and arrogance and a rebellious spirit, uh, worldly desires and self-serving ambitions. God will prune us by convicting us of all these things and cleansing us. These are all dead wood. And God prunes us by, by, by using his word to convict us of sin and then to inspire us to, to holiness and then to promote our spiritual growth. And so pruning removes evil from us and then it purifies us so that the Holy Spirit can make us fruitful. You think of Moses and for 40 years he was in that wilderness. Why, why did it take 40 years for God to get back to him? Because I believe God was just cleansing us. And I think it was D.L. Moody who said that uh, Moses spent the first 40 years of his life when he was you know, in the palace in Egypt and enjoying life in the, in the palace. He spent those 40 years you know, thinking that he was somebody. And then he spent the next 40 years of his life realizing in the desert that he was nobody. And then he spent the last 40 years of his life when God met him in the burning bush and God said, I'm going to send you. He spent the next 40 years realizing that God could do something with a nobody. Listen, when people see you as a nobody, God might be getting ready to use you, amen? Can I have a witness? When God has his head upon you, and you're at the point where you think you are a nobody, watch out because God might just appear to you in that burning bush. Now, sometimes God will prone you by removing certain people from your life so that you can focus on his divine agenda for your life. And so you look at the life of Abraham, for instance, and you know, uh, God took away Lot. Lot. Lot was greatly loved by, loved by Abraham, but God took him away. And, and the reason why God did that was because Lot was quarreling with Abraham over material things, and God said, no, this is not what I called you for. And so God removed Lot. And then later on, you read the story of Abraham, you realize that uh, God also removed Hagar and, and Ishmael, his son. Uh, he pruned him from, from Abraham's life so that Abraham could focus on raising the promised child, Isaac. I want to encourage you to use these three keys as we close out the year. As I mentioned earlier on, I don't just want this to be a theme but I want it to be something that will resonate in our hearts and our spirits into the years ahead of us because it's a fundamental blessing that God has bestowed upon us. So I want you to use these three keys so that you can be fruitful and multiply. Number one, condition your heart with righteousness so that your heart will be a good soil. Number two, so bountifully into the kingdom of God, so of your time, so of your talents, so of your treasures. And then finally, abide in Jesus and allow God to prune your heart. These are the three keys to fruitfulness that we talked about earlier in the year. And I want us to, I wanted us to revisit it so that we can continually uh, be fruitful and multiply into the years and years ahead. May God make your lives fruitful. May God watch over you. May God just abound, you know, uh, graciously toward you in every sense of the word. Would you rise up as we bring things to a close? Thank you, Jesus. And as the worship team comes in to 